Our service of Holy Eucharist Rite 2 begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Jonah. When God saw that the people of Nineveh did what what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which did not grow, you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8. We will read it responsively by verse. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. 
Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works of another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall speak of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. To me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that, I, that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory be to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. 
Am I not allowed to do what I choose with, my, with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, how many of you all are getting tired of the phrase, the new normal? Yes, we hear it everywhere. I'm getting tired of it too. I did a Google search for the phrase this morning and got 2.9 billion hits. That's not common, nothing is, right? Uh, We hear it in relation primarily, of course, to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in relation to professional sports, college sports, tension over racial injustice, economics, politics. The phrase is everywhere. And it's not just in America. Uh, One official from Nigeria writing for the World Economic Forum has cautioned against the use of that phrase, the new normal, throughout the world because it dulls our sense of discomfort with the problems that we face and makes us feel like solving these problems is a low priority. It's a good point. The new, this new normal is not working for most of us, he says, and we shouldn't be okay with that. That said, it is natural in times of suffering to seek out comfort and stability. The idea of a new normal gets us out of a crisis mentality and back into moving on with life, and that also strikes me as a fundamentally healthy attitude. So in our reading today from Philippians, St. Paul is asking this tiny church in Philippi to accept a new normal. We know from the book of Acts that Paul had only spent a short time with this church to preach the gospel and, and found a church there, and that his time there was contentious, to say the least. This is the city in which he he cast a demon out of a girl who was a fortune teller. And when her bosses, or her pimps, as it may be, uh, found out that she could no longer make any money off of her, then they haul Paul in front of the authorities, and he's beaten and thrown into the deepest dungeon they have. And there he and his fellow worker Silas sing hymns in the middle of the prison. And the earthquake comes. God sends an earthquake and sets them free. And and even their jailer and his family are converted to Christ. That jailer and his family would have been among the first audience to hear these words that we heard just a moment ago. But Paul had to leave Philippi quickly after all that. So in the absence of permanent pastoral influence, he relies upon letters and messengers, temporary leaders, to help this church become what God wants it to be. And in this passage, he's helping them define a new normal for what it means to be Christians in the world as they faced it in that day. And that is why I think it's useful for us here at St. Michael's in Illinois in 2020, that crazy year 2020, to read this, because we are facing a similar kind of situation. Our church has faced its share of adversity in the last few years. When the COVID-19 crisis hit, we were also without a permanent pastor. I'm here as an interim, but I'm temporary. I'm not able to give you either the the full-time attention or the long-term commitment that you need and deserve. Our adversities have forced us to wrestle with masks and social distance and not being able to attend church. We're not being able to sing when we're here, and probably most importantly, not being able to gather together for meetings and classes and to share food and hospitality. Right? It's hard to be church in this age. But just as Paul sees the adversity of the Philippian church as an opportunity to define a new normal, to, to sort of take control and to go forward, 
so also this time of adversity is an opportunity for St. Michael's. Rarely do churches get the chance to build themselves up from zero. And of course, in our case, since we had to shut down services altogether for several months, we can be said to be starting from zero. But this is an opportunity for the future. The St. Michael's of the past is a solid foundation, but what we become in the future is not set in stone. Paul treats the Philippian church as if they have agency in their future, as if their choices matter, because in fact they do. And so also we have agency in our future by the grace of God. Paul's exhortation lands upon our ears at just the right time, helping us as it helped them to move into an exciting future with Christ. So let's look at what Paul says to this fledgling church. He begins this passage by using an almost untranslatable word. <laughs> those, are, those kind are fun <laughs> when you come across those. Um, he says, only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. As if that's the, the number one thing. The word only means this is the major thing, the, the, the most fundamental part of your existence. Live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. But the word for live your life is this untranslatable word. It stands in our English translation in a way that sounds very personal, live your life, each one of you. But actually, it's based on the Greek word for city and for citizen. And it has special reference to laws and civil structures. So when Paul says, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel, he's reminding them that both their collective life, pardon me, move my hands too much, <laughs> both their collective life together and their individual lives, when they're apart, need to be structured carefully to fit with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To illustrate this, think about an organization such as the Boy Scouts of America who consciously structure the culture of their groups around a system of values, values that don't only apply when they're together, but also when they're apart. Maybe some of you were scouts and can repeat the scout law with me, or at least these, these major words, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. I don't have it memorized, I have it written down. <laughs> but those are great values, and those are values that scouts are supposed to show, whether they're at a scout camp meeting, or at their weekly meetings, or at home, or at school, or in their neighborhoods, or at church. Right? Everywhere they go, people should be able to tell a scout by the way he behaves. St. Paul is imagining the church the same way. Make this the main thing, he says. Only, only be sure to constitute yourselves, whether you're together or apart, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Christians should be recognizable everywhere they go by their lives that are structured around their own redemption. This knowledge that Jesus has died for us, that he became incarnate for us, that he rose again from death for us and for the whole world, and that he's coming again for us and for the whole world. Christians should love one another, therefore, and love their enemies. The Bible even says they will know you are Christians by your love. Love not just for one another, but across boundaries that divide everybody else in the world around us. Christians should be slow to anger and quick to forgive because we have been forgiven. We heard about that last week. Christians should refuse to participate in evil or corrupt activities that go on around us and stand instead for integrity and fair treatment. Christians tell others about this Lord Jesus whom they serve, and they're committed to getting up early on a Sunday morning to either view digitally or come here to be present to worship him. We could list more characteristics, but you get the point. Just like the scouts have their list of values, Christians have their lists of values and commitments. Who we are starts with what Jesus has done for each one of us in the cross and the resurrection. And that gospel drives our common life as a group and our individual lives 
at home, at work, at school, everywhere we go. And this should be a recognizable difference between us and the world that doesn't base its life on the gospel, that knows nothing of Jesus Christ, that doesn't know how much God loves them and has done for them. Paul goes on to direct the church's thinking about its future to the quality of unity, even in the midst of hard work and adversity. And sometimes I think this is the, uh, the most unrealistic command that the Scripture ever gives us, is to be of one mind. Right? It is hard to get any group of people to be of one mind about much of anything especially in these days when our culture is so divided and there, we all have different opinions about all sorts of different things and even our football loyalties are suspect sometimes. But Paul wants these people to know, he, he wants to hear about them, that they are standing firm in one spirit with one mind. Paul's expectation for unity may seem unrealistic, but is it really any harder for us than it was for them? I mean, they came from all over the Roman Empire. They, it was a cosmopolitan city, Philippi was, and, and, and they were cobbled together from all ranks of society. The, sheer, the differences between people whom Paul mentions in, later on in the letter, some of them are in the imperial household, and some of them are the poorest of the poor. Surely they had different perspectives, different views of the world, different histories that led them to the decisions they'd made so also are we, different people with different histories, different ideas, and yet we're called to a unity of spirit and a unity of mind, at, at the very least, about Christ himself. Is Paul just after unity for unity's sake, because it's generally considered a good thing to be unified as a group? I don't feel like that's where Paul is going. I think his whole expectation is framed with reference to the gospel. Live your life in a way that is worthy of the gospel. The source of unity here is the experience of Jesus. Because of that, each of these people who has experienced, experienced God's redemption can live in unity with the others. They can be of one spirit and one mind. They can, in Paul's words, strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. This was a much easier image to get when we all did farm work. <laughs> But if you've ever worked hard on a farm or in a garden with somebody else, the idea that you're doing hard work together with your hands, maybe it's hot outside, right? but you're side by side with someone else, maybe someone on your left and someone on your right, and you're all working together toward the same goal, that's the feeling that Paul is after. That we as a church strive side by side for the same goals, for the faith of the gospel. We may struggle and we may strive, but we do so in company with our fellow Christians next to us on the right and on the left with this sense of unity binding us together because we're all working together in the service of the same Lord. And Paul wants the church in no way to be intimidated by opponents. And we don't think of churches as having opponents, right? Who would object to St. Michael's being out here on this land north of town doing what it does, right? Who could possibly object to this? The churches of the early ancient Roman Empire uh, frequently experienced opposition, adversity, uh, people making up rumors about them. There were rumors that Christians were cannibals because they ate body and drank blood, right? Christians in the Roman Empire would um, go around and pick up unwanted babies in those days, you just, if you had an unwanted baby, you just left it out to die. And the Christians would come and get them and raise them as Christians. And then people would pass the rumor that the Christians were actually eating these children as part of their worship, right? which, of course, is absurd. But there was opposition then, and there is opposition in our world today. Even though churches are supposed to be nice and loving and kind and and no one could oppose all those things, yet our churches stand for a standard of righteous living that makes many people in our culture bristle. We don't want to be told what to do. And churches stand for a world in which all authorities are subject to God's definition of justice. 
And justice is a contested issue in American society today. And Christians assert that Jesus is Lord of all parts of life, private and civil. And this is not a popular notion. We're blessed that our Christianity is not so divisive right now. But Christians who take their discipleship seriously have always evoked some manner of opposition, even in supposedly Christian lands such as medieval Europe. Uh, two weeks from now, we're going to be celebrating the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi by doing a blessing of the animals on Sunday afternoon. Look for more information about that in your uh, announcements online. But St. Francis, his mission to bring a new normal to the medieval church, to, to reform it and to bring back a sense of faithfulness and integrity to the church, uh, it aroused incredible opposition from entrenched power interests in the church itself. If we're doing this Christian thing right, there will be opposition at some point. We don't need to go out and provoke it, <laughs> but we do need to be able to stand side by side with each other, knowing that our decisions are rooted in the gospel of Christ and unafraid of what this world can do to us, because if God is for us, who can be against us? And this leads us to the final characteristic of the new normal that St. Paul describes. He describes a church that suffers together. He even says it's a gracious privilege. God has graciously given you the privilege of believing in Jesus and not only believing in him, but also suffering on his behalf. Sometimes I, I think Paul is exaggerating there. Gracious privilege is not usually the way we like to describe it. But it is. It is a privilege to walk the way of the cross. Paul teaches in this very letter that those who suffer with Christ will also reign with Christ in glory. He himself considers himself to be filling up with his own sufferings the sufferings of Jesus, as if Jesus somehow left the work undone and Paul with his own suffering is sort of adding his two cents to, with what little effort he can through his suffering to join in the work of Jesus. And if we would join in the work of Jesus in our world, there will be suffering and we can all suffer together. This is the way of the cross. So as we think about the opportunity that lies before us as a congregation in the next year or two, the opportunity to create a new normal in our immediate future, these exhortations from God through St. Paul are meant to direct our thinking. Like the Philippian church, God has given us some agency in our future. We have some choice here. The ability to choose who we will be as we build up from zero into the plan that God has for us. St. Michael's can be a congregation where our members can be recognized from afar by their care for others and their commitment to Jesus Christ. We can be the church that shows unity, even in adversity and in hard work, striving side by side with one another for a common goal. We too can suffer together against opposition and even persecution, as Christians do around the world every day, because we have our eyes firmly fixed on our Redeemer and we have structured our lives, we've constituted ourselves both together and privately around this gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Please stand as we proclaim our faith in the Nicene Creed found on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are Form 1 in the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 383. With all of our heart and all of our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Daniel, our bishop, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, and for all who serve our country, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, for those who live in them, and for all those who protect us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who specially desire our prayers, especially Alex, the Soleil family, Steve, Tiffany, Robert, Marge, John, Barbara, Patrick, Philip, Chip, Zoe, Grant, Lillian, Augie, Jerry, Father Tim, Carl, Robert, Anna Claire, Raymond, June, Jordan, Joni, Annette, Rosina, Delmer, Hayden, the Reidelberger family, Joel, the Hooker family, Braden, John, Janie, Bill and Marty, Jacob, Emmy, Will, Rebecca, Dr. Philip, John, the Johnson family, the Bertram family, Beth, Dr. Anthony, Heather and Ryan, Taylor, Mike, Selena, Emily, Carol, Cullen, Marie, Tanya, Dolores, and Kitty. Are there others? Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Chelsea, Greg, Hannah, 
Miriam, and Cheryl. And for those celebrating wedding anniversaries this week, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Michael, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. O oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior, the Prince of Peace, give us grace seriously to lay to heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy divisions. Take away all hatred and prejudice, and whatever else may hinder us from godly union and concord, that, as there is but one body and one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, so we may be all of one heart and one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. In these times of COVID, we are not passing the plate, but we are still grateful for your gifts and your generosity for the church. And so we offer together this prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, from whose hand comes all that we need for life and godliness, we thank you for the generous gifts of your people, for the advance of your kingdom and the maintenance of your church. In them, your people proclaim their trust in your providence. In them we make provision for the poor and needy among us. In them we see that same divine generosity by which you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to purchase our redemption. Through him we pray, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Walk in love as Christ has loved us, gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Our great thanksgiving is Eucharistic Prayer B, found on page 367 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 367. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the Word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Michael the Archangel, and with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah! Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Our prayer after communion is found on page 365 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the announcements. Uh, next Sunday, September 27th, we will celebrate St. Michael's Sunday, our patron saint. Uh, it'll be a special day, so please, if you feel comfortable, come. Of course, if you don't, you're always welcome to watch online. Uh, it's just as good. Uh, so that'll be a special day. We're also taking a special offering that day, and we'll have an offering plate available at the back. Again, we're not passing right now, but um, we're taking up a special offering to fund outreach. We've continued to do outreach as a church, even throughout the COVID pandemic. We actually have a lot to be proud of there, um, but we need to continue to fund those things. So please do, if you have uh, something special uh, you can put away for this, uh, either... Uh, send it to the office or email the office or call us and let us know how we can help with that. Uh, your giving is greatly appreciated. Also, it will be 20 years in this building. We're gonna celebrate, finally, 20 years in this building. Um, and also, it will be 33 years since our first services at St. Michael's as a congregation. It's 33 years uh, this year, so it's an important day uh, next week. Uh, as I mentioned in the sermon, coming up uh, two weeks from now, we'll be celebrating on Sunday afternoon the blessing of the animals. That'll take place outside, weather permitting, uh, just out in the parking lot as we've done in the past. It'll be a short service a Sunday afternoon, uh, so please do look for information about that on your announcements. And you can bring animals, of course, dogs, cats, everything you've got, lizards, chickens, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, we can bless animals in abstention also if you want to bring either an art, something, a uh, lock of their hair or you know, a, 
or even just want to come and bring their name forward and we can pray for them as well. So um, we want to make sure that our animal loved ones are feeling the blessing of the Lord that day. Our Wednesday Bible study continues 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. This is a Zoom meeting. Uh, the link is available from the office. If you have the link already, it's the same link through the whole series, so you can still use that. Uh, 7 p.m. Wednesday evenings on Zoom, and uh, please do email the office if you need that link. And now receive the blessing of our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.